and this is how I usually tend to explain to patients, right? Itis means inflammation. And when you have, for example, rheumatoid arthritis, eh, where, what happens is that your immune system is causing inflammation of the, your joints, particularly the tissue that is around the joints. Dr. Sebastian Satwi, welcome to eShadowing, my friend. Thank you for the invite, Ryan. I'm, I'm glad to be here. I'm excited to talk about uh, some rheumatology, some vasculitis, um, which is, I think, a specialty and, and a world that, I don't know, room for me as, as a physician, room is always like the mysterious witch over the cauldron, like just mixing in potions. I don't know, for some reason, when I think rheumatology, I think like mysterious. Is, is that a thing? I think it is, right? Uh, and at least that's how it got me as well, I'll <laughs> say, right? Uh, I think room has a has a thing particularly that it's one of the youngest medical subspecialties as well. So mm -hmm. it's relatively new, which is is kind of exciting because at the same time, there's so much that we know now uh, of our diseases. but at the big in the big picture, I think it just represents the tip of the iceberg. So I think it, it's exciting in the sense that probably behind oncology, we are the field that like keeps just growing in knowledge, no growing in, in options for in, in kind of in treatments, growing in, in identifying new diseases as well, right? Because mm -hmm. I think historically as well, with batch things with how they look like, but now we're getting a way more granular understanding of like what what are the mechanisms that drive some of these conditions as well, which ends up kind of telling you, yeah, it was not the same thing, right? Uh, so I think that is is particularly exciting. To Two on the fact that, again, I always kind of tease kind of or say of to, uh, residents or medical students about this is like, you know, when there's some some case, some patient and someone in the hospital who nobody has any idea what's going on, right? You always get ID, oncology and rheumatology. So we're part of that, th those three that get kind of summoned on like, hey, you know, uh, again, it all starts with like good a good historian and a good clinician, independent of the specialty. Yeah. But I think we always get get kind of like pulled on that, which again, that's kind of what I think got me into at least initially as well. Yeah. So yeah. it's fun. It's fun. Yeah. I know you have some slides uh, that kind of explain that journey for you. Mm -hmm. So why don't we jump right into those and then we're, we'll have lots of time for some Q&A at the end for everyone watching. Um, for, those, for those watching, go ahead and change your chat settings to everyone so that we can all play along and say hello, let us know where you're watching from, and if rheumatology is on your list of potential specialties and why. So I want to talk about rheumatology, but I want to particularly kind of dive a little bit more into vasculitis, which are the conditions that I've been like done <laughs> far more training than I would have initially want, like thought I was going to do as, as well, uh, and which are the, the very the scope of my clinical practice, but also of kind of my research as well. So, so this is usually kind of the career path, right? And I also say that I did my medical training back home. I'm originally from Peru. Um, so medical grad train, student training for me was actually a little bit longer, right? So it was a seven year path. Um, so, and I, I'm also gonna be, I'm gonna give the kind of the disclosure and saying that throughout this long line, people change their mind, people find something else. So that is 100% normal. I, I, I'll say this because, you know, I'm at this path, at this point of my career, right? So I did medical training, I did my residency, I did fellowship, then I did another fellowship within my fellowship, and now I'm a junior faculty, right? But I kind of figured out that I wanted to do internal medicine and residency, like, and, and rheumatology, like, here, right? I, I was the kid who, like, wanted to do medical school since I think it was like seven. Uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, I think my, my parents were freaked out because my, my dad was a physician as well. And they were like, oh, this guy's just wanted to do this because, you know, he sees this role model. And they put me through like a billion different, like, you know, aptitude testing or whatever. And every single time, especially the last one, which I think some, it was someone who they kind of knew, they came and like, chill down, don't worry. This He's you know, you're a nice guy, but he's not doing this for you. He's actually <laughs> very into this, this career. So that being said, many, uh, like, did I find a bunch of things that interested me and that I found like amazing and, and, you know, uh, that, uh, throughout the path, uh, my path and throughout my residency training, hundred percent, um, never brought room 
down on the number one kind of list, but it also made me appreciate a lot my specialty because I decided that I really didn't want to just look at the heart. I just didn't just want to look at the lungs. I wanted to like basically look at everything. And that's the thing that, again, I'm, I'm, I'm very passionate about um, the, the patients that I care for is because their diseases are multisystemic. Mm -hmm. um, so rheumatology, when you go and Google it, um, and even actually I was kind of surprised that it was a little bit of a narrower definition, even in the, the American College of Rheumatology, they usually look, those are the first two lines actually. So it, it's a specialty, it's a medical specialty or pediatric specialty. Uh, I'm an adult rheumatologist. Um, kids are super fun. I have two of my own, but I like playing with them. Uh, it's, it's a specialty that deals with the diagnosis and treatment of musculoskeletal diseases and autoimmune conditions, right? So it goes from like, uh, again, just simple non-traumatic orthopedic musculoskeletal conditions such as knee arthritis, uh, tendonitis, and so forth to autoimmune conditions that are certainly more broad in their manifestations. And usually we're, that's where the, the word Roma comes from, which is conditions that commonly affect the joints, muscles, muscles and bones. So it actually comes from Latin, I'll say, or Greek, and, which is very interesting because as someone who's a primarily a Spanish speaker, a lot of my patients tell me like, oh, I have room issues. So therefore I have rheumatoid arthritis, which are regular arthritis and rheumatoid arthritis are two completely different things. But in, in, in particularly, I'll say in, in the Spanish speaking world, everyone assumes, oh, arthritis, I have a room issue. So therefore it's rheumatoid arthritis. <laughs> um, but a lot of these conditions are actually multisystemic conditions. So there are conditions that because they are f your, your immune system can affect many parts of our body. And I think, you know, the role of the immune system is a, and targeting the immune system as, as a th potential therapeutic for different kind of conditions actually is, is you know, uh, expanding into all different specialties way outside of mine only. So, and, and that that's what I would say kind of that, third bullet in particular is one of the things that I also kind of intrigued me very early on. So vasculitis, and this is how I usually tend to explain to patients, right? Itis means inflammation. And when you have, for example, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, where, what happens is that your immune system is causing inflammation of the, your joints, particularly the tissue that is around the joints. But in vasculitis, uh, you're talking about a group of inflammatory conditions, which we don't necessarily know in the etiology for most of them. But what they, what they do is they actually cause immune mediated injury to the vessel, to the to the to a specific target in some part of the vessel, uh, and it's an issue because you have vessels everywhere, and your body depends on the blood vessels in order for like the function of every single organ to to kind of to occur. So and and it probably speaks to a, a, some kind of a specific dialogue between kind of the vessel and the vascular kind of system and the immune system. And something that happens between that, co that communication, something breaks. And, and that kind of, that uh, disruption in the system leads to your immune system recognizing part of your vessels as something that is not, that they should mount an attack to, right? So immune systems are meant to actually protect us from foreign stuff, whether are bacteria or for things, for example, cells that are not normal, like cancer cells. But for some reason, in these conditions, the immune system starts attacking your vessels. And that leads to issues, right? Because when you attack the blood vessels, it causes, it changes the structure. By changing the structure, it, you don't allow the blood vessels to do what they're meant to do, which is for the blood to pass on, for them to pass the nutrient, nourish the blood vessels, nourish the organs, and, and again, for the organ to end up doing their, their function. So that leads to a target of the any organ or tissue. These are all multisystemic diseases because we have blood vessels everywhere. And these are chronic conditions, which is another thing that I, I think I, I very much enjoy about my specialty is that patients who live with this condition, most of them, um, they're going to be chronic conditions. They're going to, these are going to be part of the life. So that chronic, that care of the patient who has lives with a chronic condition, I think is something that I cherish a lot. It's a relationship that I, I value a lot with each and as every single one of my patients. But uh, as I also tell, tell patients, uh, patients and their bodies don't read the textbooks. So it doesn't mean that every single one gets a script. It doesn't mean that every single vasculitis is different. It doesn't seem that every single patient with a form of vasculitis is different. So not to get too much into path because I'm not a pathologist, but this is kind of what you would see, right? So you have a normal blood vessel that has a three different layers you, that sh should kind of remain intact. You have blood that goes through it and everything 
in order for it to allow, allow its function. And again, all these layers communicate between, the, between them. So it's not just a pipe. It's a pipe that has the ability to actually do a, cer a certain amount of functions and actually communicate with the rest of the body. However, when inflammation starts happening and this nice layers that you see, I don't know if I have my pointer on, which I should be able to figure out, but I probably won't be able to figure out. Um, they start getting disrupted, right? So this the the this nice three layers that you see kind of intact on the picture on the left side, you start seeing all this little blue per, bluish purple dots kind of getting in there, and this nice kind of lumen that you see where you had all the red blood cells on the left side now gets completely disrupted, right? You don't see a kind of a nice edge on it, and that's what happens when you start having this ongoing damage of blood vessels. The blood vessels end up getting uh, either stenosed or fibrosed or they or they died or they worse they can also get especially the bigger ones they can get dilated and that dilation can lead into rupture which the last thing that you want is that one of your large vessels kind of uh, breaking and that's kind of the hallmark uh, feature of all of these conditions <laughs> so when we talk about vasculitis like i said like i'm and i i always kind of make fun about this because I give a lecture for in our medical school for vasculitis. So it's like one hour, talk about vasculitis or for, the, for our fellows when they're straight in. A, my first disclosure in my disclosure slide, it's physically impossible for me to talk about everything that has to do with vasculitis in an hour because we're, I'm talking about at least a dozen of different, different conditions. So that's kind of a, you know, you see the, the word cloud here that includes different forms of vasculitis as well. But when we usually try to simplify this, we try to classify them uh, based on the caliber of the vessel involved. So, uh, and again, that's that's kind of for, to some degree, simplicity also, and also it's helpful actually to try to conceptualize some of these conditions and some of the manifestations of them. So we usually think, and this is a Chapel Hill classification criteria, which usually talks of vasculitis as the large vessel vasculitis, which are uh, vasculitides, which is a plural for vasculitis that involve the, the large, um, Vessels primarily um, the aorta and its branches, and it's just usually giant arteritis and tachycardic arteritis. Then you have the medium vessel vasculitis, which um, which the classic one is polyarteritis nodosa, which is a condition that we don't see as often nowadays because it's some it's a condition that historically was associated to hepatitis B and hepatitis C. Kawasaki disease, which is a um, an, an inflammatory condition that also ha has um, coronary vessel involved and actually in kids, so in, in little children. Uh, and then you have the small vessel ones, which we usually break down into two groups, which are the ones that are ANCA associated, which are um, anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies. So that's what ANCA stands for. And there are three different ones in there, microscopic polyngitis, granulomatosis with polyngitis, which we used to call Wegener's. We do not call Wegener's anymore. He was not a nice guy. And um, Eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyngitis, Jerk Strauss. So I also live in a world in a world with tons of acronyms, and then you have the immune complex ones, which are again a, a big slur of, of other conditions as well. So this is how we try to make things simple. And when and I have a little bit more here in this table, but that's one of my other teaching points to to kind of trainees or medical students is what we. Try to make things simple doesn't, uh, again, doesn't necessarily completely fulfill the script because there's some forms of vasculitis that might be small vessel, but they can, or medium vessel, and they can also affect the, um, the small vessels. There are some forms of small vas vessel vasculitis that are, can also affect the medium vessels. And then there are some that affect every single vessel that you can think of. So, all this, again, all these tables that we do, they're very nice. They're very useful for us to understand, for us to approach and make a diagnostic approach and, and kind of understand some of the concepts behind these conditions. Doesn't necessarily mean that that's how it reflects in kind of in real life. But it gives you a little bit of an idea of what you can think of or what you kind of can expect. So this, what we call pulpura purpura dyspetechia, I'm not gonna show a bunch of pictures, so I'm sorry, or the kidney disease or, or or involvement of the nerves that kind of gives a foot drop or, or gangrene, those tend to be a little bit more with some of the, the, the smaller vessels or the medium vessel one. Asthma with eosinophilia tends to be a very specific feature. And this is particularly at late onset of, of a form of EGPA. People with unexplained strokes 
right? So if you have you stroke one side and then another side, you usually expect strokes to happen in some specific territory. But when you start seeing them in different territories, you always need to think of this inflammatory conditions as well. And my usual favorite, when I like I said, uh, everyone gets like ID, hematology, and rheumatology getting both, is what we call fever of a known origin. And some of the patients that I see, so the the large vessel vasculitis. This is um, an an older woman who comes in with scalp tenderness uh, and just fever, fatigue, and 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 weight loss. And uh, and some of these patients can actually present with um, vision loss as well. And this is a condition that we call giant sore arteritis, which used to be called temporal arteritis. And it involves has this predilection for some. Um, for the temporal artery, so that the branches of the, the external carotid, but it can also involve the large arteries in our in our thera and in our chest and sometimes in our abdomen as well. There's the other form of large vessel vasculitis, which is called tachyasus arteritis, actually tends to happen in younger individuals. Again, a little bit more common in females as well. And it tends to involve not this cranial kind of artery, which the temporal artery is something that we tend to biopsy a lot for the diagnosis of these patients, but tend to involve the main branches of the aorta, including abdominal aorta, renal arteries, and the, and the presentation can be a little bit different. Uh, but, uh, large vessel vasculitis or GCA is particularly associated to, a, uh, it's part of a disease spectrum with a condition that's called polymyalgia rheumatica, which is uh, also a, an inflammatory condition that presents in older adults over 50, never, never uh, below age 50, and has an age of the onset at 70 or 80. Uh, which is characterized by significant pain and stiffness uh, of the shoulders and the hips. And patients go, feel fine, they're doing their activity, they're, they're doing great, and then one day they wake up and they just cannot wake up. So I think that what I tend to hear quite a lot is that um, they have difficulty in actually getting off their, out of their beds. And they need... They, you know, the first thing is like, hey, I was doing fine yesterday. Why am I calling my my wife or my husband or my child in the home to actually help me stand up? And then the other conditions, which I, I'm not going to get into this, but just to point out, this are we're all talking about multisystem. I'm talking about multisystemic diseases, right? Because as I said, you have blood vessels everywhere, so they can affect all the way from your brain to your skin to your joints to your um, lungs to your airway. And this is why the care of these patients, it is, is what we call multidisciplinary care. And this is one thing that I emphasize to patients a lot is that when we're talking about the care of patients with, with these conditions, this is a teamwork. <laughs> but there's always a captain of the team and the captain of the team is the patient, which is again, what I, what I enjoy. So even though in my path, I'll have to say that at some point I was uh, very interested in poem critical care as well. Uh, I love nephrology. Um, you know, I think there's there's a, a the different specialties of medicine which I enjoy the most. This my specialty gives me the kind of the pleasure of by proxy, uh, interact a lot with uh, pulmonary people, interact a lot with nephrologists, interact a lot with ophthalmology. So I get a little bit of a flavor of all the different specialties as well. And it most importantly lets me to interact a lot with patients, their families and their friends uh, in, in the care because patient empowerment is something that I think a lot of us in rheumatology take very seriously as we should in medicine um, because it helps, it, it helps and it actually helps a lot with patient outcomes. It helps the patient overall with just dealing with a chronic disease. Uh, and then taking a little bit of step further of because when I went into medicine, they decided I wanted rheumatology. And when I went into rheumatology, I decided I wanted vasculitis. And then uh, as much as I love the hospital and I love, I love the ICU, then I, I, we take care of our, of our patients in, in the inpatient setting. And then outside, uh, we start seeing our patients. We start following up. We start kind of trying to minimize some medications and see what happens, relapses happen. And a lot of the patients that I see actually are older adults. So for, like I mentioned, GCA, which is the most common form of vasculitis actually, and it's, a, it's the most common form of large vessel vasculitis, and it's kind of sister disease, PMR, polymedia rheumatica, they exclusively affect uh, adults over 50 years old with a peak incidence of 70 and 80. And if you see this little graph of GPA and MPA, which are the ANCA vasculitis, you see again, peak around age 50 for GPA, around age between 60 and 70 for MPA. So, a lot of the 
uh, my patients, the other people that I take I help take care of are actually older adults as well, which there are specific, um, you know, aspects to take into account in the care of older adults. There are specific complications with some of the treat of our treatments. And so there are a lot of factors that also we need to be taken into account. Most importantly, because treatment of vasculitis or PMR or any autoimmune condition needs a balance, right? So you need to treat the vasculitis and you need to prevent organ damage and you need to kind of help your patients with quality of life. But at the same time, I use immunosuppression, which means your immune system is going to be down, which means that Every single medication can have potential side effects and infection risk, particularly with the medications that we use are the main thing that we're all concerned about. So it's, it's the, the tricky thing of finding that balance, which I'll say that fortunately for some of our conditions, we have the development of a bunch of new therapeutics and we have good uh, trials that have actually led to a, our, our improvement of their, our understanding of those conditions, how to treat those conditions and how to minimize steroids, which is the, the medication that I probably prescribe the most. Um, and believe me, I have like every rheumatologist and patient a love-hate relationship with them. It, it's just to find that nice balance. Um, but all this, I'm a clinical researcher, but um, my colleagues who take this all the path from basic science and development of the models in order for this to get translated into clinical care, clinical trials where clinical researchers come in. So my point of, of this very busy slide is actually not necessarily to say what are the specific mechanisms that actually, you know, drive this is for anca vasculitis, but it's for you to actually look at the, the red letters and the green letters, which our understanding of how this disease has work, works and what actually drives some of these issues ends up leading into the development of uh, actual therapeutics. So all the things in red are things that are actually used now a day in common practice. Um, this one got, Avacopan got approved, uh, I want to say a year and a half ago. Rituximab has been around for vasculitis for close to 10 years, a little bit of, uh, longer than that for in oncology. Um, Cytoxan, azathioprine, mycophan, and mofetil, methotrexid as well, plasmapheresis, which we also use in some patients. But then there's other stuff, and, and actually there's some few that are, that are in the pipeline as well. So it's, it's nice to see how all this ends up translating into actual therapeutics that improve patients' outcomes, improve their quality of life, and actually has significantly changed the landscape for, for a lot of these patients. So, Science is I, cool. Yeah, <laughs> it, it is. It is very cool, I think. And, and again, I'm, I, I actually started my path like in the lab. Uh, doing a lot of translational research. I'm way more on the clinical side and like epi and some other things, but I think it, it's very nice. I, I think for someone who loved physiology a lot, and I, that's what I think I loved about renal physiology and cardiovascular physiology. At some point when I got into, into rheumatology and immunology, I felt like, man, I've lost that, right? I don't have that translation of what I know about, but but there is. And I think it's 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 fascinating how this is also just actively changing the landscape. Mm -hmm. And this is, you know, how the, the funnel, right? Like I, I started broad in internal medicine. I picked rheumatology kind of because it, it just encapsulated a lot of the things which I liked about medicine, about patient care, about research. Then I remember the first case of vasculitis that I saw because I had read a tons of books. I was actually doing a clerkship rotation here in the US and I was just like blown away. Um, by this like smart rheumatologist who just came in and said like, oh no, this is what you have. And that's what the patient had. <laughs> um, and, and then just when I, I had already kind of was subspecialized enough because after rheumatology fellowship, I did vasculitis fellowship. Uh, I started realizing that there's a specific need for a lot of the patients that I see. And particularly when you're talking about geriatrics, which uh, there's, I think a massive clinical need uh, Plus the fact that we know that the population is aging and that pro the proportion of older adults is going to keep increasing and increasing, uh, getting a further kind of scope or focus on that actually helps a lot with the care of this of this um, patients. And on top of that, I decided that I wanted to do research, which I, that's what I do. Um, so I got into medicine saying that didn't necessarily want to spend that much time sitting in front of a computer and writing stuff, which is what I do in a big proportion of my time nowadays and teaching, which is what I kind of really enjoy. And I think, although keeping the balance as well as in treatment in, 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 in a career in academia is, is always challenging. That does allow you to give kind of do 
the three things that, that kind of you enjoy the most, which keep which it's what keeps things kind of interesting for me in medicine. How, That's it how before my case. The, how, <laughs> how big is the um the private world versus the academic world for rheumatology? So what I'll say is overall, uh, rheumatology nowadays has a an issue in the in the workforce because I think. Um, because there's <clears throat> there has there was a little bit of disconnect, so a lot of people are now retiring from rheumatology, which probably COVID has you know accelerated it quite a lot, unfortunately. And the pipeline into into new people in the specialty, as much as it's become most recently, I think one of the most competitive ones, um, it really doesn't add up to kind of like really kind of equal the people that are leaving the pipeline. Uh, so I'll say there's room for everyone. <laughs> that's, that's, that's my line. I think there's a massive need. Rheumatologists, you know, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in Pennsylvania, but uh, we're even in Pennsylvania or I, I, before this, as in New York, uh, you know, there's a lack of rheumatologists, but then in states in the middle of the country, uh, there's a massive shortage of rheumatologists and wait times to see rheumatologists are awful. They can be yeah. months. Yeah. Uh, so, um, and so I think uh, my point is there's there's a need. I think depending on it's important to figure out what you like. Like I said, for me, trying to keep the balance between the three stuff was great. I've, uh, I have a lot of co uh, colleagues kind of within my faculty who do more education uh, and clinical care. A lot of them are even more heavily in research than I do. Or some people just like seeing kind of like just general rheumatology, seeing tons of patients or even doing trials because there's always opportunity to do research or participate in, in some forms of research or clinical trials in, in, in private practice. So I don't think it necessarily negates something either. It depends on kind of what you figure out is what are the pieces of the puzzle for you to be happy and have the career that you want to. Okay. Awesome. Madeline says three month wait in Wisconsin for, for a, a rheumatologist. That's, and believe me, it can be worse. Yeah. Okay. You got a case? I have a case awesome. which, um, so this is a similar, very similar to a case that I saw in, 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 in fellowship, actually, which, um, well, okay, so I can go for it. And, and if anyone has any questions or so, I have like four or five slides on this, but this is a 70 year old uh, female, actually. So I miss the word, has a history of hypertension. That's about it. A couple months back, she retired from work. She was very active, uh, work actually in an international organization. Uh, she baseline because of the city that she lives in, she um, always liked walking at least an hour a day, five days a week. She was one of the power walkers. She put on some music. She enjoyed the day, went to any work, 100% fully independent. And two months before uh, I met her, uh, she started feeling some fatigue and wasn't able to exercise again. And it was mm -hmm. just like a little bit drastic. She just woke up a day, didn't feel like it. The next day, she was like, I cannot exercise. I just don't feel like I have the energy for it that I'm drained. Um, and this just continued until one month, besides the fatigue and the being unable to exercise, which she initially had said like, well, I don't know, maybe it's age. I just turned 70. So um, I guess I can, it's normal to feel tired at my age, which, uh, spoiler, that's not right. Uh, at least not when it, there's a drastic change from not, from not I think, um, Chugging things on age is sometimes an issue. She started having low grade fevers, not every day, but like every couple of days, she just had a, up to 101. Nothing else was going on. Didn't have a sore throat, didn't have a cough or anything else. There were no sick contacts or anything. She just took some Tylenol and just tried to keep, keep going. Uh, and then, kind of a few, when the fevers kind of started, she saw her PCP and they just did some simple stuff and they got a complete blood count, which shows a mild anemia. And they noticed that her inflammatory markers, so her CRP and her ESR were just a little bit high. Uh, so, and then the fevers continued, which kind of triggered the, like, okay, you know, the, I'm not going to put like the million dollar workup that she got because I believe me, <laughs> it was a million dollar workup. Uh, but they started, you know, with like a bunch of infectious serologists, which none of them planned out. And then they got, a, um, and then they got an echo. So the, there was an echo, so a TTE that happened that I have it listed after, which this was close to this one week, uh, which was normal, but there was maybe something in the aortic valve that, you know, they said like, well, this could be something or not be something. Uh, 
And on top of all her going symptoms, by that point, she had actually lost 10 pound weight loss. So that's the story that, you know, she was telling. That's the story that, um, that kind of everyone had captured from that. Sebastian, so how, how easy is it for a busy internist to hear this story and go, oh, you're just old. It's, it's just old age. You're not supposed think, to be walking think, that much. I think, unfortunately, not to, you know, be, I guess, um, not to dismiss the, the challenges of having a massive clinical practice who see tons of patients. And as a primary care physician, you need to be seen taking care of so many things, right? Yeah. Um, and at the same time, like I said, it, it can come from two ways, right? Because I think people can fall a little bit into ageism, not only the, the healthcare providers, uh, but also patients, right? Yeah. Because the fact is that we assume that with age, uh, all things need to happen, right? Yeah. So I think it's sadly more than we would want to, especially yeah. when things are not, are not, it's not that she went from like walking to bedridden, right? Yeah. It was more of like, well, I walk a mile, an hour a day. Now I can do that. Mm -hmm. Well, you've probably been overdoing it, right? Yeah. So, which again, it's not necessarily right, but I think it's not like the patient is coming with like this huge red flag and just waving it in front of your face, right? Yeah. Uh, it might be pink at that point, but but the fact is that <laughs> it, it it's a change, right? And I think functional changes are very important in older adults as well for for all of us, but but. If you go to bed one day, haven't been able to do something, and then the next day or the, the day after that, something has changed. Okay. You know, it doesn't happen so, that fast. So for the, <laughs> for the future primary care docs listening to this, right, that is the, the takeaway is- Listening is to your patients. Is, history, uh, right? Exactly. History is always important. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, I think a lot of times we say like, oh, the patient was a poor historian. But it's because they don't use the terms, because they haven't read a medical book and tell you like, <laughs> I have ABC, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're not telling you stuff, right? Yeah. If someone comes and tells me, I was able to do this a week ago, now I'm not able to do this, mm -hmm. that's something, right? So they, they might not be telling you my, MC, my second and third MCP are swollen and stiff in the mornings when I wake up, but, they, like, but if someone is, cannot make a full fist and is dropping stuff, that's where that's how sometimes people just kind of relay their symptoms, right? They're not necessarily going to point out, you know. I would love if every one of my patients came with their homunculus, you know, and like this is this is where things <laughs> right happen, there. right? Uh, believe I would I would sleep better probably, <laughs> right? Um, and that's that's when I met her in the hospital, right? Okay. So, so this is kind of the differential, uh, which I guess if anyone has any questions or stuff, I can uh, or wants to pitch in, I'm glad to 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 answer any questions or any of review systems. But um, this is, I think, fair enough what you usually need to think of, right? I think this, this is what everyone who was in welfare care kind of thought of. Uh, well, she's, maybe she's winded, right? She cannot walk as she used to walk. She's having, like, maybe she has some heart issues. She's hypertensive, so maybe she has some underlying coronary disease. Uh, you know, that's one thing, fair. Or maybe, maybe she has some lung issues, right? She's not saying a cough or stuff like that, but again, she's winded. She, you know, she's not able to exercise. Maybe she's winded. She, maybe she's short of breath and she's not able to do all this stuff. Or she's having low grade fever, fevers. And what was that thing that they kind of maybe saw but didn't necessarily fully see in the, in the, in the transthoracic echo? Could it be an infection? Could it be subacute endocarditis? That, that was certainly one of the working diagnoses as well. Could she have a post viral syndrome, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we live in the times of, of, of COVID and, and PASC. Uh, this was before that. Um, but Post-viral infections can do stuff. Bacterial infections can do can can certainly do stuff. Whether it's just common bacteria or like spirochetes, like you know Lyme or, or a lot of other things, uh, fungal invasive fungal infections a little bit more tricky because they tend to be a little bit more aggressive. But fair, they can necessarily do so. Um, then, yeah, parasites. It, was New York. Uh, so, you know, if it was back home in Peru for me, maybe, but uh, not necessarily that. Uh, cancer. So malignancy, something to, I think, fair enough, consider as well. When someone is uh, adult having low grade fevers, now some weight loss, um, you know, this um, not as functional as before, which we usually tend to 
call, I don't think rightfully not a failure to thrive picture, which I don't, I wouldn't say that was like a full blown failure to thrive picture by any means. And then uh, kind of what about the weird autoimmune diseases, you know, that this. <laughs> it's always what House would say. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's not lupus. And I can <laughs> it's tell you it's always not, lupus. I, Come on. Yeah, I can tell you it's, it's not lupus. Uh, <laughs> But that's that's kind of the things to kind of consider. So, because of everything that was going on, um, this lady got admitted to the hospital. Maybe yes or no, but basically because of the TTE, they also wanted to do a transesophageal, uh, you know, echo, and they said like, let's we don't have an answer. Let's just kind of speed things up. So she got admitted to the hospital. Uh, like I mentioned, she had a, a TTE that maybe raised a concern for a possible aortic radiation, but then they did a T, which means that they put the probe in their, in their esophagus and which gives you a better look at the heart. They didn't, did not see anything that was concerning. She got a bunch of blood cultures. They were all normal. She, you know, her metabolic panel was normal. Her ESR and CRP were high. Her uh, CBC showed anemia and her platelets were high. And her iron studies show, uh, sorry, not iron deficiency, anemia, anemia of chronic disease, actually. So she, her ferritin was a little bit high. They got a peripheral blood flow cytometry concerning for cancer. They were, it was normal. They got a, a serum protein electrophoresis that did not show an M spy concerning for myeloma or any plasma cell dyscrasia. Uh, she was, had been already pan scanned. So CT chest, I'm a pelvis, that did, did, did not show anything. And then she got a PET scan. And the PET scan actually said, the said reports, the reports said no evidence of malignancy, of malignancy. So there was really nothing lighting up that was saying like, you know, scary, nothing concerning for malignancy. There was, they said like, well, there's a mild bilateral periarticular shoulder enhancement, uh, but they said, well, probably chronic uh, shoulder disease, chronic rotator cuff pathology. Uh, and at that point, they uh, had, so GIM was seeing her cardiology, who had actually pushed for the admission and the concern for possible subacute endocarditis, hematology oncology that said no malignancy, infectious disease for the endocarditis, and low, again, the million serologies that were all negative. And then they consulted rheumatology. Um, and when I go in and see her, um, you know, she was in her bed and she, like she tried to stand up for the time for when she tried to kind of like, you know, greet me in her room, at which clearly she had very much like a tons of difficulty doing so. And I asked her about pain, right? Because everything had been around, like, I could walk all this much. I can't walk that much. And we're talking about someone who had a very successful career. So sometimes people say like, well, you know, medical literacy and, and believe me, she, she, you know, she was, uh, I don't think it was necessarily an issue for that. It's just, again, how people really, you, we always need to do an open-ended history taken, but at some point you need to dig a little bit further, right? So she's like, actually, I do have pain uh, in both in my shoulders and a little bit in my hands and also in my hips. Forgot to add that. Uh, and then I asked her about stiffness, right? Uh, does she wake up in the morning feeling stiff? And that's where she said like, yeah, I cannot wake up from my bed without help, which she had showed me when she tried to greet me in her room. And I feel stiff, like at least until the early afternoon. Ask her about headaches and scalp tenderness and visual symptoms and any jaw claudication symptoms, which are more specific for GCA, uh, which she said none. And I didn't order, like this was already ordered because that usually happens when, you know, by the time I, con I get, cons uh, rheumatology gets consulted, this, the, the, at least the beginning of the, what people usually call the room panel, which I always say, it's not a test. It does not exist. Um, an ANA was ordered, which surprisingly was negative. You know, it's I, I I tend to be more surprised when they are negative than when than when they're positive. The ANA uh, is almost always like somebody has some ANA reaction. Exactly, right? which especially it's yeah. at age seventy, right? Yeah. Uh, which I always say, like, sure, that means that means your your tidying up system of that cell says you know is not as refined as it used to be. Period. Yep. Uh, but autoimmunity does not necessarily mean autoimmune disease, right? Because yeah. your body, your you have some antibodies there that maybe react to something in a nice little petri dish, doesn't necessarily mean that you have an autoimmune disease. Particularly yeah. again when it's like a weaker titer, right? And her RF and CC and, and her anti-CCP were also negative. So after we talked, I told her like, I know what you have, uh, and. <laughs> and you're going to take this pill and I'm going to come and see you tomorrow. So I told her, you have PMR. 
And I started on prednisone 20, 24 hours later, 80% improvement in her pain and stiffness. Her fever had gone away. She went home the next morning. Uh, like the, not one day, the day after that. Uh, she didn't follow with my attendings, was happy, started going on the steroids. That's a whole different story. Um, because it can be, again, I have a love hate relationship as I think every single rheumatologist with steroids. Um, but that was the diagnosis, right? Because sure, things can present and she could have been a patient who came into the office saying, I'm stiff, it hurts here, it hurts here, I cannot do so. But but that was not how she manifested. That's, that's not what her symptoms were. It was more mm -hmm. kind of like, I could do this, I'm not doing this anymore. And then the low grade fevers and everything else, it kind of like, I think, Rightfully, you always need to keep a, a broad differential with any condition, but at the same time, they're hints. Um, now, could it have been a different story, right? So let's say that she got her PET scan and the PET scan actually, which I'll say also that that, that was actually interpreted as, um, as, oh, rotator cuff disease or chronic OA was actually findings that were consistent with PMR, mm -hmm. uh, bilateral and same distribution, you know, particular, we don't use PMR that much, uh, well, at least not routinely, but there's like tons of data in order to let that, well, not a fair amount of data, emerging data that shows it's used for like diagnostic purposes or also monitoring purposes. Mm -hmm. But let's say she got a PET scan and she actually had increased uptake or hair ascending thoracic and thoracic aorta, right? She still had the same symptoms. She still had a shoulder pain. So in that case, she probably would have had a large vessel vasculitis and had giant arteritis, mm -hmm. which is important because that disease is different. Uh, I love how one of my teachers used to kind of call it. It all depends on the size of the fire, right? So PMR is like a 20, 15 to 20 milligram kind of fire. GCA is a 40 to 60 milligram kind of fire. Uh, so that's one thing to take into account. Plus in these patients, particularly when they've had involvement of the, of the, of the main arteries, you need to work kind of keep an eye on it because they are at a higher risk for uh, aortic aneurysms, actually. And, and when you say 20 milligram, 40 to 60 milligram, you're talking prednisone dose for treatment? That is correct, as starting. And then, yeah. so, then you start tapering off. Uh, and unfortunately, both of those conditions are relapsing conditions, right? Okay. Uh, so it's a little bit, it's, it's not that this is, we're not talking about a month of treatment. Uh, we're talking about months of treatment, even a little bit more for GCA as well. And relapses tend to be common. And because steroids act good and act very fast, they're probably not gonna lose, uh, not gonna lose their kind of their spot in my toolbox anytime soon. But at the same time, our I always tell patients my goal is to one, get you feeling better, get your disease under control, for you to continue with life. My second, my second objective is to minimize or take you off the steroids. Yeah. It's a, it's a wonderful drug and it's a terrible drug. <laughs> it's it's great acutely, chronically. Yeah. You know, it's it. Unfortunately, it's not an issue of, you know, every single medication has side effects, right? But the fact is that it's not necessarily an issue of what is what is the probability of the side effects is when you get them with, yeah. with steroids, and unfortunately, yeah. Or a different scenario would have been uh, a patient with a melanoma who was actually treated with nivolumab, one of the immune checkpoint inhibitors. And during her treatment, she was doing fine. The meloma was kind of, you know, um, significantly improving with, uh, and everything else. But then she develops the same symptoms. So that could have been what we're calling now an immune-related adverse event or a checkpoint inhibitor-induced PMR, which some of the patients who are getting this kind of the, like fantastic medications that have like really changed the, 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 the course of a lot of of, of malignancies, you know, like melanoma, uh, renal cell carcinoma, that really, you know, therapeutic, the common therapeutics at, at that point were not necessarily kind of uh, offering too much or, or, you know, survival is still quite low. Checkpoint inhibitors actually kind of wake up your immune system in a weird way. And, a, and one of the common side effects, which is somehow given the option to study some of our conditions better, is that they induce cases of PMR or they induce cases of Room, kind of rheumatoid arthritis looking like, or colitis, or even myocarditis. Um, so it's it can be a similar case, but it can, depending on who the person is or what is going on, it might have some kind of different flavors. So good, good question from Sarah here. Um, inpatient versus outpatient workup. Th this patient, it sounds like you saw them inpatient. Were they that acutely ill that they needed to be inpatient or could a lot of this ha happen to outpatient? The answer is it could have. 
Okay. And that's why I think particularly uh, for some of those conditions, it's important to, you know, I don't think, and I usually say this as well as someone who like recently navigated the healthcare system uh, as a physician, right? The, the one that I work with as well. Um, it's not easy. Especially again, seeing rheumatologists and seeing all those different specialists, wait times have, you know, are, are sometimes are very challenging sometimes. Plus, you don't know who needs to be the next cook in the kitchen, right? So the answer is yes, it could. I think there were some concerns, particularly in that patient, the findings of the TTE that raised a concern first about acute endocarditis, and they just wanted to like make this fast and quick. Because of course, if the patient had endocarditis, it was a, might have been a different story. Uh, but I think uh, sometimes what happens is that um, navigating some of this, especially if you're talking about if you owe a month plus in the outpatient setting, it, a lot of people might argue, I think, correctly that it's you just need to step it up and like kind of try to do an expedited workup. But um, but I don't think she was terribly sick. I think there was other kind of nuances around her case, plus the fact that that concern that kind of just said like let's just fix this, get her in for the TE, and see if we need to do any other invasive procedure, which would have in that setting yes happened probably faster in patient setting. Of course, you're talking about different kind of the, the logistics, the cost of it a bit. There's if we're gonna get into conversation about you know healthcare systems, I think that's uh, you're gonna need like a whole show for that. Uh, but yeah. Okay. Um, ba -da -ba -ba. So this is interesting. <laughs> this is potentially a, a, a pointed question. Because rheumatology is, is very nuanced, right? You, you had talked about the, these different scenarios. If, if this was a little bit different, it could have been this disease. If they were on this medication, it could have been this. How much misdiagnosis is happening out in the world of rheumatology, whether it's inter internists, again, they're busy, they're doing the best they can. Um, they're, they're trying to, to juggle everything and they're, they're, throwing, <laughs> they're throwing the doctor house uh, <laughs> differential at everything. Um, how, much, how many patients do you see that are just on the wrong treatment plan, wrong diagnosis, and, and they come and see you? So I think to some degree, it's, I, I would say that unlike most of this rheumatology, most of the rheumatological conditions end up having, like most of the specific treatment ends up being run by rheumatologists, mm -hmm. right? So PMR particularly has, it's, it's one of the very unique conditions in rheumatology that as much as it's actually the, the most common systemic rheumatic disease of older adults, it gets seen more by primary care and managed exclusively more by primary care physicians than by rheumatologists. And I think it has to do a little bit with probably some misconceptions about the disease, plus uh, plus the misconceptions of, oh, low dose steroids do nothing um, for everyone for everyone out there. They do stuff, uh, it's certainly not fun stuff. Uh, but I think a lot of people get into rheumatology and without, where there's a concern for lupus, there's a concern for rheumatoid without necessarily specific treatment at that point, maybe steroids on and off, but I, I, I have, cannot tell you necessarily, I've seen a lot of people without it, with, with, on, with things on chronically without seeing a rheumatologist first. Now, what I think it's an issue that we work, uh, that we tend to see a lot of patients for, is when people get diagnosed or told that they have something based on a blood, uh, a blah, uh, you know, a positive rheumatoid factor or a positive ANA. And that happens very often. So I think if you ask any room, if you poll, you know, 10 rheumatologists uh, or maybe someone who doesn't have like very kind of a very small niche like me, but even in, in my case, because I do have a general rheumatology practice, the most common, um, you know, um, diagnosis is going to be like positive uh, or referral is positive ANA, right? A positive ANA and, oh, and especially I think getting someone to rheumatology for a positive ANA to rule out or work for the possibility of a, of a, of a rheumatologic disease or a connective tissue disease, I think that's absolutely fine. That's what we're here for. What I think it's sometimes a little bit challenging is when the message comes with, oh, you have a positive ANA, you have lupus. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an issue because the first thing that I tell pa uh, patients is, you know, after hearing their story, 
is first of all, also because a lot of times it's like, oh, the ANA is positive, you have this, you need to see rheumatology, and there's no further explanation of what the test might mean or not mean, uh, is 10 to 20% of the population who don't have a rheumatologic disease have a positive ANA. Yeah. And two, there's not a there's not a test in rheumatology that says, boom, you have this. Mm-hmm. Right? It's not an A1C. Uh, yeah. So I think that's a lot of our work ends up kind of going into, well, let's take a step back. Let's listen to your history because the fact is that rheum- most of the diagnoses in rheumatology are made based on history, based on clinical findings and were either lab tests or imaging tests have, you know, are, are an added, have an added value, but they're not making the diagnosis, right? Uh, of course, okay, I live in the vasculitis world. If you come with a biopsy, different story. Uh, but, uh, or if you come with a PET scan who has like, you know, your aura lighting up from the base of the aorta all the way to, you know, to the abdominal aorta, fair. But, but in most scenarios, that's not the case, particularly for, for blood tests, right? Our inflammatory markers, CSRM, CRP, oh, those are high rheumatologic disease. They can be high for a multitude of reasons. Mm. cancer, infections, you know, your ESR can go up with age. So it, it's not necessarily that. The other setting is, which I think we also take a lot of time with educating our, our, our patients and our colleagues is not everything is your rheumatologic or your autoimmune disease, right? Oh, I have, a, I have this weird fatigue that is happening for the past, you know, month on someone who has a controlled rheumatologic disease. I've been told that it's, or I thought it was just mostly my, my rheumatologic disease because, you know, lupus gets fatigue or rheumatoid arthritis is fatigue. Mm-hmm. Yes, but uh, not, you know, you're a whole. It's, you're not a, that necessarily a diagnosis. So that's the part that it's also important of saying, independent of your diagnosis, you need to take into account what, a, what if something else could be contributing to this or if there could be an alternative cause. So I think that's another part of our, of, of our job where it's advocating for the patient, not necessarily advocating for the care. In the same setting, I think, you know, our patients probably see us more than the primary care physicians as well. Yeah. So we, we have a kind of a unique seat at the table that it's, uh, that as much as I cannot necessarily take care of screening colonoscopies, you know, there's so much that I can, that I, that I can do when I'm taking care of like this very complex conditions. And that's why communication is key. And that's why, you know, there are all this hands around but the patients in the middle, it's, it's also very important. Yeah. Uh, if anyone has a question, uh, you want to raise your hand, we'll probably have room for, for one quick question before we head out. Raise your hand. <coughs> Let's see. Let's see if I can get Joseph on here allowed to talk you there joseph hello. i am hello hello can you hear me yep we can hear you hi hi how's it going uh, thanks for having me um so um i was just wondering like um just to, um in simplest terms dr ryan was kind of asking um uh questions about diagnosis and uh diseases and kind of like what's the accuracy I was wondering if like you could maybe just simplify your response. <laughs> to, to to what? To like um to um like so um uh like is there room for uh expansion in, in that area like in terms of like developing new biotechnologies? Ah, hundred percent, totally. So absolutely, that, that okay. there's like yeah no no, that again that that the what what do we need for what do we need in rheumatology and what is everyone working towards to? Uh, I would love to have a simple response for for the answer and how you diagnose stuff. You leave me again, I would sleep better. But the <laughs> fact is the fact is that right now that's not the case. What I think we all want to is better defined conditions and better identify better biomarkers of disease as well, right? I would rather not wait until a patient flares and they're in kidney failure for me in order to say, okay, something is acting up and we might need to twinkle your, you know, uh, your, your medications. I think uh, we, at the same time, not every single patient with, a, with lupus or not every single patient with GPA is exactly the same. And, there's, and, and why do some patients flare more? Why do some patients need treatment for longer? That's because 
the mechanism behind the disease for each single person is different. And that's where I think, for example, oncology is like, you know, steps way, many steps ahead because they're being able to actually not only see what's, what the tumor looks like, but at the same time, well, or what a patient looks like with a specific cancer, but what did the tumor look, tumors look like? What are the genes that actually lead to expression of that? And, and seeing all that, that's where kind of, I think we need to head towards too. Um, we need to be able to develop more personalized care and in taking into account who the patient is, uh, but at the same time, what their disease is specifically. And that's where we need to head for. Um, again, if, we, if I, at some point, would be able to have a blood test that tells me 100%, you know, sensitivity specificity, this patient has X disease, I'm in. But, uh, but that's what we need to keep working for. Uh, a lot of our conditions are still, you know, relative, uh, still youngish. You know, a lot of these conditions were someone gave them an, a name several years back, and then you started realizing that there were like 10 different diseases within that name. And that's what, uh, and, 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 you know, we need to actually work on better uh, identification, better description in order to lead to better therapeutics. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah. <clears throat> Dr. Sebastian Satwe, thank you so much for coming on and sharing vasculitis, vasculitis <laughs> and, uh, and rheumatology with our students today. Okay. Thank you for the invite. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Hopefully this was helpful. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.